Thank you. Can, can everybody hear me all right? So um, this is Glycoscience Research is a GM1 gangly side business, and then we also have WH Land and Livestock. W is for Waller. That's my maiden name, and I married this holler guy. So it was Waller, holler, land, and livestock. We should probably be in Kentucky or someplace. But anyway, that's where WH Land and Livestock came from. Uh-oh. There we go. Okay. So um, I'm going to take you on a, a tour of the farm since I can't load you all up on a bus and, and take you to South Dakota. Who wants to go to South Dakota? It's sub-zero today. Um, but this was a tour we gave to the South Dakota sheep growers um, in September of 14. So we'll just kind of do a loop around the farm and get you better acquainted with our farm and with us. So here we are in white South Dakota. Now, probably, we're not a typical South Dakota operation because as you can see, we're almost a Minnesota operation. We're pretty close and our our ground and our management issues are much more like a Minnesota farm, really, than a, a west, you know, for sure as you go farther west in South Dakota. So here's, here's pretty much what we started with. We bought the farm in 94, really didn't have a sheep type fence on the place. We came and looked at it in February and it was 37 below and two foot of snow. We didn't really know what we were buying. But um, we, so we, we started out in that first, and this is kind of, it's interesting because it's always been a grassroots project. This first barn, this one that we put up, we put up that fall of 94. And there's a little country church, if you follow this road this way, about a mile down the road, there's a little country church that we started attending. And, um, you know, they knew we were working on the farm and trying to get it set up for the sheep. And um, Larry and the neighbor had set posts for the, for the pole barn, and it got announced at church that we were having a barn raising party. <laughs> so everybody bring your cordless drill. And so that barn went up one Saturday in the fall of 94 with the help of church members. So it's just, it's kind of been that, an interesting progress the whole way through. So it was basically most recently a hog farm. There's an old far uh, farrowing barn that Larry came through um, with the neighbor and cut out the crates and we used it as a lambing barn for quite a while. Um, a finishing floor. So I've got three pens on a hog finishing floor out here and a concrete pad. Um, and this is just an old cattle shed which should be torn down but is actually pretty useful so we keep using it. Here's what we looked like today. So this is a good reminder we've done something the last 20 years. <laughs> so um, in 98, oops, you have to, we put up this barn. This gets used for a variety of purposes. I have a couple pens in there. We can. Uh, mixing pens, ewe lambs, market lambs, um, whatever we need there. We did re-roof the uh, farrowing barn that was a lambing barn for quite a while and we have since outgrown that. It now raises bottle lambs and this cattle shed is re-roofed so, so they're there for the duration I guess. In 2010 we put up this, uh, we call it the north barn um, and it has pens in there. It was basically intended for a facility for affected lambs. Uh, holding facility and then it has a processing room on the on the west end of it and then more recently in 2013 we put up the new barn um, we'd called this one the south barn so that's a little confusing because now we got a barn farther south than that one but it's the new barn or new lambing barn at the same year we also put up a, a commodity bay a commodity shed with three bays in it and so that's that's been really useful too so um, because we are in eastern South Dakota, our land is very low and very wet. When we first bought the place, one of the neighbors said, you'll really like it in a dry year. I didn't know what that meant, <laughs> but we have learned. So you can, it goes hand in hand with wet land, there's parasites. So when we were out west, we'd graze the, um, in Idaho, we'd graze the clear cuts, the timber land in the summer, and then we were in central Washington in the winter. And I, I should say we, because I was, um, part owner in about a thousand ewe flock, um, Targhee flock, western whiteface, and we kind of moved to where the feed was. So, see, Larry got a heck of a dowry when, <laughs> I had about 10% of that, 100, about 130 ewes at the time. So anyway, so we, um, we've had to deal with parasites. We hardly ever wormed sheep out west. I think we did lambs one year just because we hadn't done it in a while. But, um, wow, within a month of moving to this farm, we were having parasite problems. And of course, we couldn't believe it. It was like, that can't be due to parasites. Well. I guess when you have a paras uh, pathologist in the family, he can tell you exactly what it is. So, um, so we've gotten to know Dr. Mike Hild Hildreth uh, real well here. Here's the, and it's, it's bad when a parasitologist loves your sheep, by the way. <laughs> so we have managed to um, get resistance to Dectamax and 
maybe to a lesser extent, valbazin. Um, so we've had to be a little creative. We can still use uh, cydectin and levamisole, but we've kind of gone through the FAMACHA phase and, and trying all sorts of different things. Um, we, pretty amazing, I think the top, and then checking fecals also. Probably the top, I could call her her top you, but um, 40,000 eggs per gram. I mean, he loved us. The, the most amazing thing, though, is with the FAMACHA, because one summer, the hired hand and I, we would, we were famaching on pasture. We'd pen up the ewes, famacha, and then treat anybody that was anemic. Well, that ewe with the 40,000 eggs per gram was not anemic. So it is fairly amazing. So we have gone a little bit away from the famacha. Um, we did last year, we, before we turned out, we did a three-way dewormer to try to clean everybody out because we had such a heavy parasite load. Um, that seemed to be really beneficial. Another major component is pasture rotation. Um, the farm, we have a couple hundred acres, and it's um, divided. I have, um, about two-thirds, one-third, hay ground and pasture. And I, we rotate on a weekly basis because that's how fast those larvae, the eggs are going to be hatching out. So we're doing pretty well. The fecals that we collected this year, were, they're a lot lower than ever were, maybe a couple hundred. So I'm not sure we've got it totally figured out, but we're making progress. And I kind of learned that in the sheep business. You never quite get it figured out, but as long as you're making progress, you're good. This is um, Dr. Anwar Sarah uh, with Dr. Hilderth, and he's working on a PhD in parasitology. He's a Iraqi veterinarian, so pretty interesting guy. Um, so here's what we look like in the spring. We just, the grass is way ahead of us, and um, we try to come through and, and graze and rotate. Um, the hay ground will take a first cutting off of it and then come back and graze it second, and maybe, you know, if we can get a third rotation through it. So it's a garrison grass, it's a creeping foxtail, and it loves water. So the wetter it is, the better it likes it. Um, and it's good TDN, it's a nice, it's a nice feed. It's a, a lot of leaf on the plant, so um, they do well on it. The, the trick is harvesting it, because usually you can't get into your hay fields until at least after the 4th of July, and, and even then it can be a little tricky. Um, uh, so here's, here's fall grazing. This is one of our garrison grass hay fields. And these were seeded like in the 60s and the 70s. So it's amazing. It's amazing um, hay ground and, and feed for the sheep. Um, and, you know, it's kind of sub-irrigated here. Here we are in the fall, and that's pretty nice grazing for the fall. So this is looking south from our farm. Okay, and here's, I thought I'd introduce you to the Border Collie crew. We've got uh, a young dog. She's actually Border Collie. Um, Australian Shepherd Cross, so she's a little confused on how she's supposed to work. She's my first crossbred dog, so her name is Hope, or Hope Less, depending on how she's working. Um, here's Jake, and he's kind of my middle-aged Border Collie. I can get a lot done with him, but don't ask Larry about him. He doesn't work for Larry, so <laughs> they don't get along well. And then my old dog, she's, she's 12, and I, I think deaf, but I haven't ever, you know, sometimes she almost seems like she hears me, but she kind of just does her own thing. So. That's kind of the crew, and just kind of a neat picture. Um, we worked with uh, Nicole Richmond with Strauss Meats, and she came out and kind of documented the farm for one of their family farmers for Strauss Meats, and I just thought that was a pretty cool picture out on the pasture. And um, fortunately, the kids got off the bus, and they, and they were really helpful when they got home. I guess, you know, have somebody videotaping, and they, they work harder. Um, here's a, a ram pasture that we have. It's just out behind the house in the trees, and boy, the sheep have really cleaned that up well, so we put the rams out there in the summer and then in the fall and winter they come back into a, it's a Hobart building. Um, pretty nice um, shelter for the rams. I like it because it's right up front. So I see the rams right up front every day so I don't neglect them. They're not in the back corner of the farm. Um, I can fit pretty easily a dozen on each side. And here's this North Barn um, building with the processing facility on it. So, and, and one thing, Larry's pretty much designed all these own buildings, and one thing that he's done is he's made them very versatile. So we can use them a lot of different ways. I've got outside pens, we've got, we'll show you the inside pens as we go, and different size pens, and here's the inside of the processing facility. So we have coolers. Um, you can see some uh, the carcasses hanging in there. We did buy a, a walk-in cooler. We're still in the process of setting that up. And we have the bandsaw now. Larry, Craigslist, is that where Craigslist? I think Craigslist was the bandsaw, but um, Larry's the economy kind of guy, so. <laughs> um, but everybody loves the bandsaw, and we also got in, into a little direct marketing. Somehow, the local Muslim population 
um, has found us and found this nice processing facility. So they come out and they call it the machine. So the, can we use the machine? <laughs> and so we have to be a little careful with that. You have to be specifically trained. But here's um, a PhD pharmacy student, Mater, um, who organized this group for EAD. And so he, it was kind of nice, because I'm sure some of you that have direct marketed, it gets to be a lot of work. You know, I finally had to tell the guys, listen, I have a stock trailer. I can load 80 lambs on a stock trailer, drive 45 miles, unload them, and I'm done, instead of working with each one of you individually. So he got it, and, and so he, he kind of organized this group and, and made sure they weren't too, you know, not too many of them wanted to come out ahead of time and pick a sheep. And uh, one guy was pretty funny because he, um, you know, he wanted no blemishes at all. Had to be intact, had no blemishes. Well, and you might notice on later pictures, on the weathers, I, I tip their ear so I know it's a weather. So when we're sorting replacement ewe lambs, I don't have to go hunting to decide if that's a weather or not. Well, when he noticed one of those, he goes, oh, I can't have that one. It, it, it has a blemish. I was like, oh, I did that. So anyway, we finally found one for him. But um, So it's been an in interesting learning curve. I think Larry figured there was seven different countries represented in, in this slide. So yeah, so this was uh, late September. We were supposed to be headed to Rapid City for the South Dakota Sheep Growers meeting, but we were a little detained. But um, So here's just kind of an average carcass. You're probably going to be in that 40 to 50 pound range. Um, it's you know, this is just average. Uh, this carcass definitely probably could have some more uh, leg expression. Um, but, you know, we just kind of snapped it because it was, there, there are a few that will go bigger, but um, that's generally about where they, they end up. So, as Larry said, very tasty. I mean, they're, and we do eat a lot of lamb. And, but my kids love it. They don't really like beef because it's too chewy. <laughs> so, I thought, so they've grown up on it. Here's the, here, do it yourselfers again. Um, the pouring, we did learn how to pour concrete, so it's a neighbor project, and then Larry screeding, and, and Paul was about 12 at that stage, so. Um, but, well, well, we'll keep going. So here's kind of the finished product. So we have a nice wide alleyway, and kind of in the interim between um, the old lambing barn and the new lambing barn, we, were, we had a little bit of a quandary where to um, lamb out these sheep. So we actually set up jugs along this north wall, and that actually worked pretty good. They could, on these Vern panels, you can come out the front of these Vern panels, just pop a pin, and, and we'd move them right across into jugs. The only downside is this is the farthest north building on the farm. So, <laughs> you're laughing. When it blows, it finds little cracks to blow through and come in, you know, they sheep with snow on their backs and stuff like that. But it actually worked pretty well in the interim. And here's, here's one of our favorite guard dogs. We've always, we actually raised Akbosh for a while, and we've always had guard dogs on the place. Um, here's the outside lots, just some shorn ewes, um, and I can divide that into four pens again, and they can be inside or out or any combination thereof. Um, here's this old hog finishing barn, um, and it's a very versatile barn too. We've, I think there are market lambs in there right now. Um, and here's insi inside the barn, it had um, an alleyway for loading out hogs. So Larry converted that to um, a shearing facility. So we've got three pens. So in the far pen, the ewes that are waiting to be sheared are standing there. They load the alley. They come down here. And if you can see, we've got little burlap sacks here to kind of keep them from looking out. And then there's a trip board. So it's on, here's a board right here, if you can see that. And it's on two bungees. So you come up and you step on it. And then the, you just trips right out. It's, it's really handy. We have also kind of outgrown this facility too. This will hold three shears. Last year we had a crew of five come in with their own setup and for some reason they wanted to be in the insulated barn. I'm not, I didn't quite get that. That was February. And here's, here's Gabe again. A little worried about what we were doing to his sheep. Um, also on just the south side of this barn, um, we have a, in the summer we have a working facility set up. So this also is very versatile. I've got a couple Oops. A couple holding pens down here, and then they come through the tub and down the chute. They can go back out in the big lot, or I have three inside pens, or even a pen behind the barn. So um, there again, just gives you a lot of options. Here's, here's the feed alley attached with that barn, um, and these are yearling ewes in there um, in this slide. Okay, and these are... And I had an older picture here of um, replacement ewe lambs from a couple years ago, and I, 
I said, I have to go take a new picture because we have done a lot of crossbreeding. You know, when we first got there, you know, the buyer said, your sheep are too small. We gotta have bigger sheep. Okay, so we tried crossbreeding with some bigger breeds and you know, we got in some issues that maybe we weren't real happy with. But right now we're kind of on a polypay in Ile de France line and uh, I just, our ewe lambs are just starting to look much more uniform and just pretty productive ewes, you know, for mutants. We shouldn't say mutants, but you know, for a sheep that carries a, a genetic disorder, we've turned it, put in a, the gene in a real productive sheep. And we've also learned on this farm that concrete is our friend. Any chance we get, we need to, we're just so low and so wet. And one neighbor said, yeah, you are kind of in a hole there, aren't you? And I, I'm glad she pointed that out. I'd never quite thought of it that way. But um, so that's really helpful. Um, and we've also learned to use other forms of crushed concrete. Now, it's, it's nice to be right along I-29 with all the road construction. So we've learned that a two to three inch concrete with the finer stuff on top makes a really nice surface to drive on. And here's the, the big barn under construction. And I, I don't know why we build, why do we build barns when there's snow on the ground? I, we seem to have this trend. And then you're rushing to finish it. We had two blizzards while we were building the north barn and the builders were, they called and said, do you have snow removal equipment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we had to dig it out twice before they got roof on, on the roof on. Now we're pretty fun couple. <laughs> you laugh, so I'm sure you can relate. <laughs> um, and one nice thing is the builders left their scissors left. So these are a couple of college students that were working for us, and I don't, he's got his thumbs up, I think. So <laughs> they were enjoying the scissors lift, but unfortunately that left Larry on the ladder. <laughs> so we did a lot of the interior finish work. Larry's a um, man of many talents. He's an uh, electrician, plumber. Um, we've kind of, he's kind of learned to do all these things over the years. The first year in the barn, we had some water issues, you know, and it condensation on the roof, and then it'd warm up, and it'd rain in the barn. I'd heard people talk about that, but I'd never experienced it. So the next year, we put in a ceiling, and it definitely improved things quite a bit. So a vapor barrier, and then the steel, and then insulation on top of that. And here's, here again, just versatility of the barn. This is the same barn, but I have outside lots on the south side. And these are some fall lammers that they got kicked out because we were doing the ceiling. So just been weaned. Here gives you a little different angle on the barn. And we do have an office in there, and I'll show you the interior space in a minute. Here's, here's a nice feed alley out here um, with 150 foot of feed bunk on each side. You can see the cross gates down here, so that gives me a lot of options there too. So I've got a pen with the, with the drop barn here. We have some portable sheds in here. I actually have a, that little west barn here, you know, plus this whole side, they can come out of the barn to eat or eat inside. So it just, it's just really nice to have a lot of different ways you can go. Here's in the Gabe again, um, and he really likes the barn too, you can tell. <laughs> um, here's the, the, this is the interior space, so you're looking at that in there. So the sheep flow comes, they come lamb out in these pens, and as soon as they um, have a lamb out, they come into the, uh, the warmer interior space in there. And here's kind of the finishing touches on that. It's a nice space. It's nice and bright, lots of lights in there, white ceiling, white walls. So real good visibility watching the lambs. What we do is when we bring them in is we put them in these, it's kind of a double size lambing jug. We call them warm up pens. So we pull them in there and then they can finish lambing. And, and I really enjoy it because then they're right in there with you and you don't have to be running back out and, and checking on them all the time. We have about four of those and they only stay in there for you know a few couple hours until they're done lambing and then they move to a jug. The other thing that is in this picture that I really like is I have a little cart with all my processing because um, you can imagine we do a lot of record keeping um, and so it has all my record keeping materials, ear tags, I think there's even a milk bottle on there but I, I push that, it's kind of, you know, when you have that long alleyway, it's, I push that down the alleyways and process the lambs right in front of the used pens. It really reduces on the moms getting upset and sheep jumping and, and that sort of thing. So here's, now this one made me feel a little bad because I had six pound babies, but um, this you I thought I think it's about 40 pounds of lamb between these three. So she's in there in a warm up pen. Okay, and here's just kind of the, the alleyway. We use drop hoses. Um, we kind of priced the PVC pipe in the jugs and it was kind of spendy at the time and then worry about fecal contamination in those. So Larry 
wanted to do with the drop hoses. So that, that works well for us. And the other thing for me, you know, it can get pretty crazy in the lamb and barn and, you know, family stuff and you're going 10 different directions. If I have to stand there and fill a water bucket, I spend a little time looking at those lambs where if you just have the PV, I don't know how you do with the, the PVC pipe, you maybe don't spend that, you know, half a minute actually looking at the lamb and picking up stuff you wouldn't pick up just walking by. Um, and everybody likes the new barn. The lambs, just a nice environment, and the dog. The photo hound likes the new barn. Um, and then, I just threw this one in for all those parents that might relate to this. <laughs> um, and so, and I think most of all the shepherds like the new barn. Um, it's just nice to be able to come in and have your drop pens and your lambing barn and your mixing pens all in one location. That, it took us a while to to get to that point. And these are spring lambs in South Dakota, even though it doesn't look very springy. But after when they're about a month of age, they'll move out to the, we have to make space for the next ones coming up. So they'll move out in, into an ex, a barn with an exterior lot. Either that north barn or this is the south barn here in group, groups of about 50 ewes. And um, here's my favorite bottle lamb feeder. <laughs> and. Um, we, we've gone to putting, um, there was a, a, putting lambs in raised pens. So we got this idea, it's just a farrowing crate, the mesh floor that was salvaged from a, a pig farm. And um, I put about 10 bottle lambs in here. It's nice because it's, it's raised and it's on wheels. I went and visited another farm and I saw these pens and, and you know, I said, how do you clean those out underneath those? And <laughs> she had to admit it was pretty awful. So actually the neighbor said, those need to be on wheels. So we really enjoy that. You just push them out of the way, scrape everything out, and go again. And right now we're feeding with uh, buckets, the Premier buckets, but um, we're hoping to switch to a Lactec machine. My, my milk replacer mixer person is getting tired. His wrist is bad, so we're thinking about going to a Lactec machine. Now, I invite you to the farm anytime, um, but be aware that we do tend to name bottle lambs after visitors. So this is a good friend of, of Larry's that stopped, and and Bobby and his mom, Mary. So we had Bobby and Mary. Um, here's a commodity shed, and, and you can see the, the bale yard. As you go out here, we have bale yard. Um, this has been really useful for, you know, sometimes we have distiller's grains in, or soy hulls, or um, corn stalks, or, you know, whatever. It just gives us a lot more opportunities. And we do feed with a, a feed wagon, um, double screw. And, and that's, that's really nice. The, uh, really uniform, but boy, if it breaks down, we all panic. Um, the last three years, we've done corn silage, so that's been a nice addition um, in the ag bags. Um, and then since it's about two, we hay about two thirds of the farm. So, um, you know, here's our Vermeer haying equipment, and um, these Mr. eBay over here. These are eBay purchases. He managed to get those bids in before they really put reserves on equipment. And somebody did it at a busy time of year and didn't put a reserve in, so. Got a good deal on hanging equipment. Um, this New Holland tractor is also an eBay purchase. <laughs> um, there's my son driving it, and he helped his dad. I think he was in grade school when they were bidding on this online. So, um, and of course, the manure spreader. Spend time cleaning out barns. And another piece of equipment that we just can't do without. Um, we haul buckets, probably use it for stuff we shouldn't, haul corn buckets and all sorts of things. And that's another one that if it goes down, everybody panics. Um, we used to have the feed truck come out with kind of a corn pellet mix, but then, um, actually it was yours feeding distiller's grains. I needed to be able to mix it on the farm. And so we bought just an old grinder mixer. It doesn't do a great job grinding. Um, so if I need cracked corn, I still have them bring out cracked corn. But great job mixing and delivering into either Bachmeyer feeders or Shenandoah feeders. So we really like that. And I do have two of them because they're old and they break too. So we were, I think we were mixing feed in a skid steer bucket one time because it went down and that, yeah, that wasn't a lot of fun. So made sure we had, next auction we went to, we got a second one. And here's, sometimes it's tough living with a college professor because anytime you do anything, you have to have the lecture and then that's followed by a demonstration and then you have the lab practical. So. <laughs> Um, we, we do trim feed every year. One, because foot rot scares the heck out of me. When I was out at University of Idaho, we, they were trying to clean up a foot rot mess, and I, yeah, um, 
and also because we're so low and so wet, those sheep feet never wear down. So we're much better off just to trim everybody before they go to pasture and, and then do a lot better during the summer. Um, we've pre had guard dogs on the place almost all the time we've been there with the exception of about four months. And boy, they are opportunists. They moved in. Um, our, we had a guard dog, and she was weighing in at about 130 pounds because she came across the scale when we were sorting lambs. But we get a lot of semi-traffic on our road because we have a big dairy unit, a big hog unit just past us. And they hit her right at the end of the driveway. It was, it was really sad. But boy, it didn't take these guys long to move in. And we have a great state trapper. He came out. Um, within the next six months, he caught 18 coyotes. And 14, 14 of them were caught in snares coming right into our pasture. I, I, just hard to believe. So, and then we do a lot of butchering, so they kind of know, know where that happens too. So um, I've got another couple young Akwash started, and I, if I have to, I'll, I'll, I'll outnumber them. We'll have more guard dogs than coyotes. Um, so you can, you can imagine that the record keeping is pretty extensive here, and we, since we are in the scrapey flock, um, certified program at the export monitored level. I have to track every animal, every animal that was on the farm last year. I have to um, tell them, you know, if she's not there, where she went, who did she go to, if she died, her head has to be submitted. So there's a lot of record keeping and we've been doing it just on paper. Um, and I do have a database I use. However, there's a lot of data entry there. So um, we're transitioning to the Shearwell system this year and we've got um, transition to the FarmWorks database and where's Dan, is Dan in here? So you have to talk to Dan, because it's a really cool system. Um, everything's electronic, we're, our electronic ear tags are on order, so I think, I think that'll help a lot and save a lot of, um, a lot of time um, with data entry and just keeping track of animals a lot better. Here's pretty much what I would consider a, you know, a really nice ewe lamb. We're going for an open face, white face uh, lamb um, that's easy to work with. Um, Here's the, some of the ewes on pasture. We did start out with a little more Monadale influence. You can see the girl, the older ewe, whoops, the older ewe in the middle. Um, I've since trying to decrease frame size a little bit. I think we maybe went too extreme. So we're coming back and then again with those uh, Polypay and uh, Ile de France. I really like the Ile de France on these big frame ewes. They've really more moderate size, better width. Um, so anyway, we're just kind of getting started with those, but that seems to be a good cross on my flock. And here's a picture of some of a pen of affecteds. So they, they look like just any other, other lamb, really. Um, I've had feed salesmen out there and I said, so you can tell the difference between this pen and that pen. And they say, well, they're maybe not running around quite as much as the pen next to them. But other than that, there's really not a lot of difference. Here's, I'll let you do the video. Here's some that are on the farm right now. I just took this video this week and the, the the mark on them, there's three affecteds in this pen, so you'll kind of see them move around. And these are September lambs, so they're 100 days of age. So, and, and these guys, maybe they're toward the smaller end of this group, but that's, there's a wide range in affecteds, just as you would have in any group of lambs. And go ahead on that one. These are some lambs that um, we'd already harvested most everybody else, and these are two that are left that I took um, a little of. This one, you can see she's having a little bit trouble getting around as that GM1 really builds up. This one, I'm, this girl right here, I'm not sure you can really even tell on her. She's still moving really well. But that's kind of what you'll notice, some kind of in coordination, just uh, moving a little differently than a normal lamb. And I've had sheep producers say, I, I can't tell the difference. So that's kind of the goal. We want them to look like just any other sheep. Okay, now a little bit about the shepherd's gift. And this was kind of inspired by a, how am I doing time-wise? Oh, okay, we'll make it. Um, by uh, the Hansen family came to the, Larry presented at the South Dakota Sheep Growers meeting and the Hansen family came. And um, wow, their family, and she, Caitlin is the one, she's 24 now, that has a juvenile form of HD. And what an amazing, brave young woman. So they did a roller blanket auction for Caitlin that night at the auction. and. Um, that was the seed money for the shepherd's gift. So uh, the IRS paperwork got filed soon after that, and by spring we were a nonprofit. And I, I shouldn't say, you know, this project, the, the board members for the project are HD families. Larry and I are not on the board. 
And here's, here's Kate. And um, it's been so hard in the three years that we've known her to see how this disease is ravaging her body. Um, in high school, she kind of started to, she was an A student and suddenly, you know, wasn't anymore. Things were getting harder. Um, and at 18, she got tested and was gene positive. Now, um, not all pregnancies are planned. She didn't plan to have a little girl, but Nevea, which is heaven spelled backward, is the most adorable. She's three now, little girl you could possibly imagine. And Tara, her mom, um, is on the board of directors for the Shepherd's Gift, and this is Mike, her stepdad, and he's a pretty amazing guy, too. Um, here's, since Kate was diagnosed at 18, she didn't qualify for a Make-A-Wish trip. So Tara works for a veterinarian um, in Iowa, and they work with a lot of pet breeders. So the pet breeder sponsored a trip. Uh, this was just this last year to, uh, to Florida, to Disneyland and SeaWorld. And she's got three amazing little, here's her, her full brother, Mikey. And he was kind of struggling with the possibility that he would have Huntington's. Um, got tested and, and did not. So now that, you know, that adds a whole nother thing to family. Here's his older sister that has it. He doesn't have it. Um, you know, I'm sure Mike could address that too. And then she has three little stepbrothers. And they call these guys the button boys. Um, and they sell buttons and jewelry. Quite a bit of my jewelry is from the Button Boys <laughs> um, to raise money for a Juvenile Huntington's Disease Research and um, and to help to help Huntington's families. So, and I'm glad they got the trip when they did because I don't think Kate will be able to travel anymore. When we saw her in October, it, um, it's really getting hard for her. And here's, here's Landon. So when they came out to the farm, they wanted to donate some money to the sheep project. And that's, so we said, okay, pick out a ewe. And so that's Landon's ewe right there. So we send him lamb pictures and he gets pretty excited. Here's just a, um, yeah, just kind of a tough picture to look at to know that this little girl is going to lose her mom in not too many years from now. And Kate's just, and the hard thing about Huntington's is you can, um, it's hard for them to talk but you can, they know what you're saying. It's just really hard for them to communicate. So you can sit there and she can give me one word answers. But um, it's, yeah, just to see what she's going through. And with the juvenile form, she, there's more rigidity. She had a lot of shakes and um, she's getting really tough. So anyway, um, the Shepherd's Gift organizes the first annual um, Shepherd's Gift golf tournament down in Sioux City, Iowa, one of the, uh, Kate and her family were there, and another family was there. And it was the end of October. It was just a beautiful day. Everybody just really had a good time. I think about 84 golfers. Um, here's Todd Oss, and he, um, he's trained as a veterinarian. He was diagnosed in 2005 with HD. By 2009, he had to sell his practice because he could no longer do surgery and, and function as a veterinarian. So, But he was out there. He has trouble getting around. Um, his wife, Nikki, tells stories about their house and if he falls and hits the drywall she's got a guy that'll come in and patch her drywall for her so and it's hard for him to feed himself and but he was out there on the golf course um, there was one story they turned a corner too fast and he got dumped out of the golf cart but he's tough got right up and kept going so and here's here's his family and this is his um, it's his young younger sister Robin and she is already in a nursing home and um, they brought her out for the evening dinner. They had to feed her. She cannot hold her head up by herself. Um, so pretty, yeah, just such a devastating disease. So here's, this is Todd's mom, and she lost her husband to HD, and now she's going to lose both children to HD. I, it's just beyond comprehension. So um, anyway. And here's another family. Uh, so Nikki, in that last slide, Nikki's on the Shepherd's, Shepherd's Gift Board. Here's Tricia, and she, um, she is also on the board. Now, um, this is her mom, Anna Hilton, and she has passed away. Um, she was one of 10 children. They had no family history of HD, and knew, kind of knew something was wrong, kind of like what Mike was talking about, and then they got the diagnosis of HD. And Tricia said since she was one of 10 children, and they, you know, those kids were, you know, in her 50s, I think she was diagnosed. So already had adult children who had children. 
So as Tricia puts it, that one single diagnosis for her mom was stunning, and that's certainly not in the good way. Now Anna has four children. Um, we know that three of the four have been tested, or, and three are gene positive. I don't think we know about the fourth one. So that was really tough for Tricia to go public with her gene status. Um, you know, there's a lot of implications there. She said, got to deal with insurance stuff and, and some things before I, you know, really try to promote, you know, what we're doing and, and be an advocate for HD. So here is, here's Tricia has um, three kids. Um, let's see, one, two, and three. The oldest girl is adopted from Mongolia, but the other two are biologic. And then these are cousins, um, her brother's two girls, and he is also gene positive. So in this picture, we have four beautiful little girls that are 50% risk of getting HD. And here's kind of another, that these stories are just getting really tough for Larry and I, because we know we have a treatment that'll help these people, but a 16-year-old that visited the farm with her grandmother. And her mom had died when she was 12 of HD. She was diagnosed right after she was born. Um, and her grandmother kept her mom at home and taken care of her till she passed away. And at 16, she was really struggling. She didn't know if she had it, um, since the recommendation is not test till 18. So she was waiting on her test results, and her grandmother brought her out to the farm to give her some hope. And Larry was talking to the grandmother, and I was talking to Emily, and they weren't from a farm, and she said, do any of your sheep have names? And I went, oh, uh, no, they all have numbers. And then I went, oh, wait a minute. When my younger son was in preschool, he had a good buddy, Emily. So we have a couple Emilys in the flock. So I said, let's go find Emily. So we went and found Emily 612, and we took their picture together. Uh, thankfully, we kind of heard through the grapevine, her test was negative, so she doesn't have HD. So that's a huge, huge relief. But you can imagine the psychology, just the, what these people go through. You know, do you get tested? Do you not? Do you want to know? And if you do know, what's your future like? So this whole project has been families helping families. And this is one of our cooperator families. Last spring, I was over there helping them sample lambs because they hadn't bled lambs before. So it's uh, Terry and Mary Ness. And um, they were about ready to retire from sheep production. They thought, you know, this is a lot of work. We want to spend more time with the grandkids. But Mary has a classmate of hers that's already in a nursing home with HD. And so they were really motivated. They called this. They have, three, they have four daughters. Three of them are here and then a son-in-law. And they called everybody together and said, if we're going to do this, this has to be a family project. Do we want to do this? And pretty unanimous, they said, we're doing it. So that's kind of their story. And it's kind of amazing that you know, the dozen or more cooperators we have so far, their stories are all pretty similar to that. They're really doing it for the right reasons and to push this forward to, to get a treatment for people who desperately need it. And that's about it. Did I make it? Yay, I made it. <laughs> so any questions? Uh-huh. Right. Well, there's normal, which would be a homozygous uh, dominant. Is that the right way to say it? Um, so they would. That's just a normal sheep. If sheep are normal, that's a normal sheep. And the carriers in the normal sheep, do they get to go through the normal meat? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, because the the carriers are a heterozygous, so they still have some of that beta galactosidase enzyme to function normally. So they they just carry it. They're a, a yeah, asymptomatic sure. carrier. Yeah, they they can. They're normal. Of the lambs are okay. Well, kind of. If I breed carrier to carrier, I should get 25% affected, and then the affected are the ones, you know, that we harvest on the farm. That okay. Within, and and their tissues. You haven't really talked about what tissues we collect, but. And we didn't really talk. You know, there's, there's a reality going forward. There's a lot of reproductive technologies and actually other so, genetic yeah. technology that Here. we can use. Anyway, other genetic technologies uh, to actually increase production. Uh, the reality is that ovine or GM1 gangliosidosis is actually a human disease. And actually, as we speak, they're developing a treatment for GM1 gangliosidosis, a genetic treatment that could be applied uh, directly to this project. Uh, if you were to take a ram 
who is genetically affected with GM1 gangliosidosis, you can actually replace the defective gene and create an animal. You'll be doing most of this in utero or, or shortly after, but basically create a, a, a genetically affected ram who's clinically normal. And then all of a sudden, we would double the number of lambs, affected lambs that we could use for the project. So in connection with that, Larry, is there any possibility of collecting semen from these homozygous five-month-old rams? We've had uh, lots of discussions of what kind of, actually, I'm good friends with and do a lot of work uh, I'm for Transova Genetics. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. It's a, a primarily a cattle genetics uh, firm in Iowa, but they also do a lot of sheep stuff. And so there is a lot of genetic technology that could be applied. You could potentially harvest semen uh, from the testes of, of these affected rams. Probably more efficient would be to go after oocytes from the, the ewe lambs, splitting them. Uh, Transova, uh, you know, their, their approach is we'll just clone them. You know, theoretically, you could take and create a cloned individual, an affected clone individual. And, you know, what I, I have kind of my own bias. I, I, I embrace technology, obviously. I, I'm a proponent. But the, the reality is that, you know, the, these, these technological approaches, in my mind, are only a partial solution. I think we as an industry, through normal production channels, can be the major port of producing these animals. And then we use technologies to make our producers more effective. <clears throat> yeah. We did a lot of talking yesterday because some uh, they're going to have some problems. Well, and, and so he, he, the point is of, of cloning transgenic anything. Uh, everybody asks, you know, are these transgenic animals? No, these are godgenic animals. They were created as a spontaneous mutation out in the pastures of eastern Washington. All we've done for 20 years is, is be, be their shepherds. Uh, if you go transgenic, you do enter into an entirely different realm. And I actually told that to the Transova folks, is, is not being transgenic, not cloning, has actually been a benefit. Yeah. The genetic testing is a blood-based test, a purple blood top, EDTA blood top, purple EDTA blood sample. It's a PCR-based test. It is probably a little more expensive now just because we don't have the throughput, the number of samples. It's probably costing us about $15 a sample. Uh, we pay for that for all the folks that are cooperating right now, so they, they get them tested free. I didn't, you know, going forward, I don't know how that will all work. Um. One. Oh, yeah, just one comment Larry mentioned about the sheep industry improvement grant that we, you know, we really appreciate that. And um, we also did get some grant funding through the Let's Grow um, organization. Alan's here today, so we really appreciate that. Well, we realize that just we need to promote this project more, and that's why we're videotaping today um, to get the word out a little bit more. But we just really appreciated the backing from sheep producers and, and you know, the groundswell from the industry. It's, you know, it's families helping families, so it's... We're going to have to move along. Let's uh, give a round of applause to the hollers for their.